Okay, here we go. I figured instead of doing a floss tube today, I would show a time lapse video of me doing one of my blocks for my tummy trick quilt, which I have not touched since uh, the beginning of June. <laughs> uh, each block takes 45 minutes to stitch out, so this is going to be time lapse. Um, so this is the first day of June, so this is nine days worth of temperatures. Um, so, and since it's springtime, I have my spring quilting, which is bees. And then for wintertime, I have snowflakes. For fall, there's leaves. In summer, there's seashells. So, uh, so this is block 17. So we're going to be working on block 18. This is what I did. I printed out my blocks. So there's two blocks per page, and then I dated all of the things and then each time I write down a temperature in my calendar after I get enough to fill up a block I write in the temperature and then the corresponding color for the temperature. This block is going to be kind of boring because it only has two colors the bright green and the marigold. So woohoo. So here's what we do. First I have my gingham that's for my sides and top. I have everything cut into strips. These are pre-cut to the size I need, but um, like this flower and the, the temperature colors, I all have them all cut to I think three inches wide and then I just cut long strips because I found that was the easiest way to do it and the most economical for fabric, so I don't use up as much fabric. Um, so here's my marigold. And these are just um, fabrics that I got from Walmart. Uh, you can buy pre-cut, one yard pre-cuts, or you can buy fat quarters. Um, so I think these are from the one yards. Um, some of the colors that I knew I wouldn't be using as much of, I just got the fat quarters. But that's the two colors, the bright green and the marigold. Then this is the flower part that's on the sides. You do the same process, so they're cut into three inch strips. So I thought it's like a black and white cherry blossom. So there's that. And then the gingham goes on the sides and on the top. So that's the fabric. So then I have pre-cut batting. And for this quilt, I wanted it to be more obvious. Like I wanted it to really show the quilting. So I wanted it to be poofier, like, you know, poofier. <laughs> so I'm using, this is the 80-20, I have fuzz in my mouth. This is 80-20, quilters batting and you can buy Walmart again has I think three different size rolls that you can buy the pre cut thing walk this way without running and you can see it comes in a bag that's rolled up it's like folded and rolled um, so I cut it to the width I need and then I just cut st strips so I go ahead and pre-cut the size I need for my hoop, which this is the 360 by 200. So this is, I think, the royal hoop for Husqvarna. And then I buy the first batting, or the first stabilizer I got was from my stepmom, and it was the Inspira comes from the Husqvarna gallery but I found this on Amazon and it comes in a big roll this is already I think I've used about a third of it but it's just the right width for my hoop so what I do is I just line it up I roll it out and then I cut it again that way I get the most Uh, I, I don't use, I don't waste as much. 
So I just cut it to... Ooh, my camera did not like that. <laughs> it wanted to unfocus. So then, I just keep the rest on here. So I only cut what I need. And then I put it back over here. So that's ready. Then I get that in the hoop. And then I put my batting in there. Once I've got that in the hoop, I just throw my batting on. I have marks, and I just marked on my hoop with permanent marker. But when I, ooh, whoa! <laughs> Sorry. Apparently, my table was not latched into place. So I mark on the hoop where I want my batting to sit. So it's lined up with that, but the pattern itself is like to here. Now when I'm done, I can just take an alcohol wipe and clean that off. So I do it, if I'm going to be doing the same size thing over and over and over, and I wanna make sure I get my stuff centered. Um, so I would have this in the hoop, and then I just make sure my batting is kind of lined up with those lines. So there's like where I want the batting. So the pattern will actually stitch to that line. So I know I don't have to do the tack down, or the, not the tack down, not the tack down, the placement line, because I already know where I want it placed, so that's one less line I have to stitch. Um, so there we go, I will get this in the hoop, and I will get set up on my machine over here, Ooh, all ready to go, so here we go, I'll be back in a second. Okay, so, I have my machine set up, um, I'm going to show you how I do it, um, but I'm going to try to do it without sound because the sewing machine is really loud. Um, and I had to clip it, clip my, you know, like tripody thing to something else because also I can't clip to the desk because the desk moves while it's stitching. So I figured that'd probably make people sick. Um, so I had this set up. I keep my paper, my cheat sheet here. I keep my flower strip on one leg, my color on my other leg. So as I go, I can just grab them and do my thing back and forth. Um, but the first thing it does is it stitches the outside line. Um, so I'm going to start doing that but I'm going to start a new little video clip because this is where I'm going to start the time lapse. Um, but I just want to show you, this is how it goes. I have my two pieces of batting. I've got my stabilizer in the hoop. So here we go. I will be right back in just a second with the time lapse.
Okay, here I am. I have to hold down the side to make sure it is straight and flat. Or it will make the quilt block lay funny and the quilting won't look as good. And then I do the same thing on the other side. And there it goes. I make sure it stays flat. This, I, like I said, I haven't worked on this quilt since June. It's now September. I could not figure out what scissors I used to use. It wasn't those. Maybe it was the other ones. Nope, not those. It turns out all I used were those little embroidery scissors. So now everything is good now that I realize that that's what I used to use. So you stitch the line, then you flip it, and then it stitches the outline. And then you trim the block. Now I'm gonna grab, grab the other scissors and they're not gonna work either because they're too big. So, yep, I just realized they're too big. And back to the embroidery scissors. <laughs> And then I also realized it was easier to just stay standing up. Now, the cherry blossom paper, or fabric, you put it down upside down, stitch the placement line, then you flip it so it's right side up, and then it stitches the outline. And you trim. And then the other one, you don't have to worry about right side up or upside down because they're the same on both sides. So there you go. You stitch the placement line, you flip it, you stitch the outline over and over and over and over. And here comes my little girl. She has questions, she wants to know what's going on, and she wants me to open a pack of graham crackers, so. She'll be back in a little while. This just shows the way I use the strips instead of pre-cutting like little rectangles. This little bit is all that's left of the bottom of that last strip. It was just like a half an inch. So I was able to use almost an entire strip and not have very much to throw away. If I would have done 
little rectangles, I would have had about a half an inch every single time. So it would have been a big waste. Okay, so after this, I have to check and see which one is the one that I need the green. It's not this one. It's the next one. But I had to check like three times because I didn't want to mess up. <laughs> Since most of this block is the marigold. So. it It's an easier block because it's all the same color. But you want to make sure you get the color in the right spot. Some of the blocks, there's lots and lots of temperature changes. But apparently these ni this nine-day stretch was in the 80s the whole time. So there you go.
So here I'm doing the bottom corner piece of the marigold. And you'll see me show you not to cut this corner once it's stitched. See, no, don't cut that corner. Because what I do is I wait until I get the, the flower corner done too. And then it'll go to the top to do the gingham. And it's easier to cut the whole corner or both corners at the same time when it goes to the top. So now I can cut that corner off and then go all the way around to the other corner. I realized that, that at some point that it was easier to do it that way, so now that's the way I do it. Now when I cut my gingham, I did not do a very good job the second time I cut it. Um, so my lines are not on the lines of the gingham. So I always make sure to start on whichever side is going to make it so I can line the lines up. Because I make sure my gingham is straight by stitching along one of the lines. And then when I fold it over... Um, it'll make it so it's straight. Same thing, I make sure that I find the best line to stitch along so when I fold it, it it'll be straight. And it's not as bad on these little pieces for the top and the bottom, but it's really bad on the long strips where I'm off by like two rows almost on the gingham. So you'll see on the longer ones maybe how bad the lines are. So I go a couple rows over to make sure that it'll be straight. And it is also very much easier to sit down for this part so I can watch the line of the gingham and I can hold the end of the fabric and move it so I can make sure that my needle is stitching along the actual gingham line. And then when I fold it over, oh, see, I showed on one side it's way wider than on the other side. <laughs> when I fold it over, I hold it tight so I can keep the needle again going down the straight line. And it also makes it so when it does the flower quilting, it doesn't bunch up as much. So I do the same thing on the other side. I have to figure out which side to start on. And then I do the same thing. I hold it and guide it with um, my back hand to make sure that it's going straight. And it almost got tangled up there and I was like, no, no, no. I didn't want it to get caught under the needle. But it worked. And then same thing when I flip it, I hold it tight so it doesn't bunch up my quilting when it does the quilting. This is really, this is when it's doing its like little outline stitches. So this is like the first time you actually have time to get up and do something 
for like five minutes while it's doing this outside stitching. Now, if you don't care about jump stitches getting cut um, after it's done with these outside borders, it starts the flower stitching. But there's jump stitches between each flower, and I don't like to have to cut the jump stitches later. I cut it as it's doing it. So I could technically go and get a sandwich or do whatever for like 10 minutes. But I just sit and I make sure my back or my jump stitches are cut. And here's my little girl. Shoot, this time she's coming to help. She wants to watch. So I put her on my lap so she can watch. <laughs> I say I'm filming. <laughs> so you gotta be quiet. She wants to know what's going on. She's like, why is there a hole there? And I said, it's because that's where the needle goes through. Now when it gets to the end of this little bit, every single time I have a trouble with it tangling up, so I stop it before it gets to that bottom corner. And then I start it again. Now we just started the bees. So now each one of those squares takes five minutes. So I can actually get up.
All right, tried to zoom in so you could see the quilting a little bit better, but since the sewing machine has these LED lights, it's hard to see anyway. But I also tried to speed up the machine a little bit too, so it would be done faster. I generally don't like to run it this fast because it makes it really loud. Oh, there's what it's stitching. Here it said it had a thread jammed under the needle plate, so I had to fiddle with it to get it to clear it. But there we go. It was just from the jump stitch. And here we go again. All better. Sometimes it's just when it goes to cut the thread it gets caught. Okay, so there we go. All done. So this is a spring block, so it has the beads. 
and let's see. There we go. Also, it looks shiny, and it's not. It's just a gray thread. Um, so this is two different patterns, or two different stitch files, I guess. Um, it's the French braid and the flowers quilted and then I got these quilting blocks like quilting squares from a different shop and I got these for spring shells for summer leaves for fall and snowflakes for winter um so I will show you what they look like Obviously, this is the spring. Um, the only difference, I decided to flip the middle one. So the big B was over here and the little B was over here. That way it was more of a mix. And then here's the leaves for fall. Same thing, I flipped the middle block because you couldn't see these. And then winter is snowflakes. And then summer is seashells. And again, I flipped the middle quilting because you couldn't even see these, so I figured I would flip it. So, um, I think there's only a couple more blocks of spring, and then I get to switch to the seashells. So, there we go. Quick little thing. So, like I said, I'd use as little stabilizer as I can. Um, and then when I'm done with my blocks, I just fold this down and fold this down. This is block number 18. I made myself, there's the camera, <laughs> made myself little numbers. So when I go to put them together, I put them together in the right order. And then I just pin that in the corner. Without stabbing yourself. There we go. So the T-pin is not, not very sharp, apparently. Yeah. So... Now it's number 18, and it can go up on my quilt board. I don't know if you sat through the whole thing. If you did, that's awesome. If not, oh well. Um, I'll be back with more floss tube next week. I think I'm going to do it every week. Um, thank you for watching.